like you to turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is being filmed, so anything that you say can and will be held against you at the judgment seat of Christ. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Corinthians, and this is the second part of our lesson on what I've chosen to call separation. And this lesson is basically uh, just about uh, practical uh, holiness. And we use the term separation because... Are you following me? You want me to follow you all the way over there? Yeah, you better follow me. <laughs> I'm teasing. I like to mess with our camera lady. Um, we call it separation because of this passage that you're looking at, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, this is our kind of main theme verse for this particular study. Uh, toward the end of the chapter, beginning with verse 14, we'll read it, then we'll make some other uh, statements. Separation uh, is simple. I, I say that it's like, uh, it's like practical holiness. But separation is basically you going from one place and separating from it and going toward another. Anytime you make a move in any direction, you are separating to some degree. It's possible for you to separate from something right, okay, as well as separate from something wrong. And we're going to talk to you in this lesson about things we should be separated from and things that we should be separated to. We're, we're getting close to the end of things that we should be separated from. But the main thing first is a passage here in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I will just real quickly say that I believe that separation is the key to fellowship with God. And I do not believe that the things that we are pointing out to you are necessary for salvation. Even though that it says, well, if you'll do this, I'll be a father unto you. And I've explained it this way, that I believe it's possible to be related to somebody uh, by birth, but not be uh, enjoying that relationship by practice. That is, it's possible uh, many people in this class have got grown children. And it's possible for a grown child to approach you in bitterness and say on this Father's Day, well, the reason why I didn't call is you never were a father to me. Okay? And what they're saying is, is that the dad was uh, doing his part in establishing the fellowship that a father and son ought to have. And the dad might respond in anger to the son, well, boy, you never were a son to me. Now, they're not denying the, the physical birth. They're not denying the legal or physical relationship. But one was claiming that the other was not what they ought to be. You were not a father. And uh, God wants to be a father to you. God wants to be a shepherd uh, to you. He is your uh, Savior judicially but He can shepherd you, save you, and do a lot of other things practically. And I believe that the key to fellowship is being willing to withdraw from the things that God wants you to withdraw from and people and join up to the things God wants you to join up to, and then you'll be able to enjoy the fellowship. There are people who are saved people, in my opinion. I'm going to tell you what I believe, okay? And I believe that there are people who have been saved by the grace of God who yet do not enjoy the fellowship with God that they should have because of living in disobedience to the Lord. By quick review, 
will mention some things that a believer ought to be separated from. All of you separated this morning to be able to come to Sunday school. Every one of you practice separation. Um, what you separate from? As for me, you separate from the house. As for me, I separate from the bed. Okay, That's probably my greatest temptation, just stay in bed. Uh, I separate from the bed to come to the house. Every time you go somewhere, you're separating from one thing. You may not be thinking about it, but you separate from one thing to go to the other. Now, separation, first of all, we said a believer should be separate from an unequal yoke with unbelievers. We're not going to go back over that because of time. Second, this, you don't hear this much preach. Most people that, most old fashioned preachers that preach about separation, everybody's heard it. All they think is, is the guy's preaching is drinking, smoking, cussing, and that kind of stuff. But this passage actually says we should be separate from lazy believers. That is, if someone will not work, we're supposed to have no company with that person, then he'll be ashamed. Then he'll be ashamed. Um, well, to be separate from wicked people who claim to be saved. I want to go over this verse that we put up here. Uh, would you take your Bibles, please, and turn to Proverbs chapter 13. I think we close with that verse, but I want you to turn to it again. Proverbs chapter 13. And it's, it's important when we talk about uh, being separate from wicked people who claim to be saved, this has to do with you being a companion of them. I believe that a Christian ought to be friendly to everybody. Okay? I believe that a Christian ought to be one of the most likable uh, people that there is on the job, in the neighborhood, or whatever. That doesn't mean you compromise and do wrong, but I do believe that you ought to be a, a friendly person. But there's a difference between greeting people with a smile, asking how they're doing, opening the door for them or whatever, and choosing to become what I'll call bosom buddies with that person. You do not uh, want to become close uh, companions with wicked people. And there are two reasons for that. If you have Proverbs chapter 13, I want you to look at verse 20. This is where we closed last time. I'm going to go over it again because we've got new people here today. Proverbs 13, 20, and I personally believe this is one of the most important verses in the Bible about uh, practically uh, succeeding as a Christian because in addition to the basics I told you about, one of the things that's going to help you is who you get close to in your life. One of the things that's going to hinder you is who you get close to uh, in your life. Uh, Proverbs 13, 20 says this, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Everybody see that? That's what happens when you're companion with people. Number one, you tend to become like them. If you hang around me long enough, you be careful, be careful. You hang around me long enough and enough hours of the day, before you know it, you'll be saying y'all. <laughs> before you know it, because it just rubs off on you. If you're not careful, over a period of time, you'll be saying, you reckon? Or I'm fixing <laughs> to do this and that. And, uh, and, and I just use that as an illustration of something that's neither bad nor good. But just saying, we tend to be like the people that we hang around because it just rubs off on us. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Second thing that happens to you is not only you, do you tend to become like the people you're closest to, but secondly, you have some of the same things happen to you that happen to them. You have some of the same consequences. And the second half of the verse says, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Not only will the fools be destroyed, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. It's possible for you to not be like them and everything, but if you're not careful, because that you yoke up with them, you're liable to have some of the same bad consequences. Some of you have had that happen perhaps to yourself. Some of you have seen that happen to children or loved ones. And you, you believe them when they tell you, I did not go there intending on getting involved in that. But I was at the wrong place in the wrong, at the wrong time with the wrong people. And I ended up in jail. I'm not going to ask you for it for time's sake, but I'm sure we have some people here that could give us some illustrations uh, of that, of people that you know that some of them ended up in prison. 
Some of them, you know, ended up in divorce court or whatever because they chose to get too close to the wrong people and they ended up suffering some of the same consequences. So the believer should uh, uh, be separate from wicked people who claim to be saved. Why don't you take your Bibles and turn to the New Testament, the 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. This uh, passage is dealing a little bit with sin among God's people. And we're not going to read this, the entire passage here. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, and we'll read... 1 Corinthians 5, we'll read 10 and 11. <coughs> 9, and, 9 through 11. Let's begin at 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company. Notice the word company. That's what companionship is about. You spend enough time with somebody in company, you become a companion. Not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Okay, you can't get to where uh, you say, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to work at a place where they've got uh, wicked people there and say people there. You need to think about that because your work uh, can consist of an unequal yoke and they can affect you. But you can't say, well, I'm not going to shop at that place because they got wicked people there. Um, the fact is, you'd have to come out of the world. That's what this verse said. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, verse 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must you needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, that is a saved person, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such in one know not to eat. All right, so the Christian ought to be careful about getting too close to wicked people even if they claim to be saved. I'm not going to get you to turn to this one for uh, time's sake, but I want to say that the Christian should separate himself next from iniquity. He should separate himself from iniquity. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Would all of us agree with that? I mean, that's just basically saying that Christians ought to live right, and Christians should not uh, live wrong. And there's a number of reasons for that. We covered some of that in the lesson on service. But the Bible says, As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I want you to take your Bibles and see if you can find in the New Testament the book of First Thessalonians. The book of 1 Thessalonians, and 1 Thessalonians, I'd like you to turn please to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is full of, of brief verses, very short verses, but they're pretty powerful. And we want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. And in talking about separation, and by the way, this is our last point on the negative. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. So the Christian should be concerned. Now you, you hear Christians because of a verse in Samuel where uh, the Lord told Samuel to don't be impressed by the stature, height, or good looks of Jesse's boys um, because uh, I'm going to show you which one I picked out to replace Saul as king over Israel. And people have gotten to where they misread what uh, the Lord said. Because the Lord says that the man that the Lord seeth not as man seeth, because it says that man looketh on the outer outward appearance, 
but the Lord looketh on the heart. And so some people have taken that verse to say that the Bible says God doesn't look on the outward appearance. That's not so. What the verse is saying is, is if man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Do you think God doesn't see what you look like on the outside? It's just showing, the verse is just showing that we can be impressed by what we see on the outside, but God can see beyond that. God pays attention to what you look like. And he tells you you should pay attention to what you look like. Um, that's why that the verse in 1 Thessalonians uh, says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why you need to be concerned with what you look like on the outside is that people are looking. You say, well, I don't care what people think. Well, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, for that reason, and for the reason of this verse right here, abstain from all appearance of evil, I recommend that you don't do anything that you think looks bad. Okay? Uh, for instance, I have every freedom in the world outside of this kind of verse here um, I have every freedom in the world to get me a um, get me a glass that uh, has got uh, uh, a beer company's name on it and fill it with sweet tea. You Yankees don't know what sweet tea is, but. Godly people drink sweet tea. Okay? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm joking. I'm speaking tongue tea. Okay, but if you were to see me drinking tea out of a glass that's marked up with a logo that's, either, that's got some kind of liquor thing on it, then even though that I'm, I'm doing right by drinking sweet tea, sweet tea will make you godly. You know that, right? <laughs> uh, I, I'm kidding. I, but, I'm, but I'm doing okay by drinking sweet tea. But by doing it, say, in the presence of other people especially, but by doing it in the presence of other people, they may look and say, look, I, I saw that preacher. <laughs> and look, I, I swear I saw him drinking beer. You know. And the fact was, is I, I wasn't, but I didn't, avoid, I didn't abstain from all appearance of evil. Be careful, uh, because you have liberty to do a lot of things, but you can't just live unto yourself. All right. So the believer should be separated from the appearance of evil. Do you know that God even cares um, about these cross-dressers? And, uh, and I do not go out to unsaved people and try to straighten them out about how they dress. So unsaved people don't need to be talked about about not living the Christian life, as far as I'm concerned. I don't try to straighten them out about Christian doctrine. Uh, I just try to be used of God to show them what sin is, get them to admit that they've sinned, get them to admit they need a Savior from their sin, and I try to show them how to be saved. But the Bible in Deuteronomy 22.5, Deuteronomy 22.5 says that a man shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a woman, neither shall a woman put on the man's garment. I may have forgotten it backwards. And it says, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord. Even in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about how that men ought to wear short hair, women ought to wear long hair. And that's not my opinion, okay? Uh, I came up in the Woodstock generation. Anybody remember your history? I came up in the Beatles generation. I came, up, I came in uh, to my teenage years in the free love, is what we call it back then. That was our word for fornication back in those days is free love. <laughs> free love, flower power, you know, all that. Get high and run around with whoever you wanted to. That's the generation I came up with. I'm not saying this because that I'm, you know, from that uh, generation that lived that way. Um, I could have got involved in, in all of those kinds of things. But the Lord wants you uh, to, to live in such a way that our, for instance, the Bible says that women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. And I've given you the verse in your, uh, in your handout that we'll give to you, God willing, uh, today in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to believe or be 
be separated too. Uh, number one, the believer ought to be separated to the gospel. That is, he should be separated uh, to getting people saved. We'll just, we'll just put number one, we'll just put the gospel. But every Christian ought to, positively speaking, okay, you quit your cussing, that's good. Okay, you quit telling filthy jokes, that's good. Quit telling suggestive stuff, double entendre, and innuendos, and all this kind of stuff. You started trying to not say the things that are that are bad. What should you say? You ought to say some things that are good. One of the best things you can say is, the Lord loves you. The Lord sent his son, Jesus Christ, down the cross for you. And so the believer ought to be separated to the gospel. And here's a verse for you <clears throat> to, to uh, you can turn to if you want to, but we're about to run out of time. And that's Romans chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul introduced the epistle to the Romans by saying that he was separated unto the gospel of God. And the, the next thing you should be separated to is to the work that God wants you to do in His work. Now, God doesn't want everybody to be a pastor. But God may want you to do something else. He may want you to be a pastor. He may want you to teach a class like this. Uh, for, for a few years, uh, this class in another church that I pastored years ago was taught by a man who became a preacher later. He became a pastor. But at that time, he was just a member of our church. And he was a loyal member of our church. But he taught this over and over and over. Six lessons. Took about two weeks per lesson. And he taught this class. You need to find out what God wants you to do. It could be that God wants you to keep a nursery. You could be great at perhaps organizing a nursery. Uh, you might teach at a Christian school. You might drive a bus. You might be a deacon, be a missionary. You might uh, work with young people. You might sing in the choir. Perhaps you're good at doing solos or, or whatever. But in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So positively speaking, you ought to be separated unto uh, what God wants you to do. Now the secret of the Christian life is finding out what God wants you to do and then doing it. Now, this is basically separation uh, from and separation to. We're going to close here and